Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're digging into a really persistent challenge in our field, that lingering residual risk our patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease are left with, even when we think we're doing everything right. We're going to explore how finironin, a selective non-steroidal MRA, specifically targets a key pathway that's often left unaddressed, and how that can really change the game. So to make this real, let's start with a patient case. I'm willing to bet this will feel very familiar to you. Let's meet Raj. So this is Raj. He's 57. He feels pretty good. He's asymptomatic. And honestly, if you just take a quick glance at his clinical profile, he looks stable, maybe even well-managed. He's had type 2 diabetes for about 10 years. His A1C and his blood pressure, pretty close to target. And his EGFR of 64 puts him in that CKD stage G2 category, which, you know, on its own might not set off any major alarm bells. On paper, you could almost call him a success story. But this is where, as clinicians, we really have to pause and ask ourselves, are we truly seeing the whole picture? Are these standard metrics, especially EGFR alone, telling us the full story about his future risk? Well, the picture changes completely when we add just one more critical piece of data, his UACR, his urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Rogers is 352. So now when we plot him on the KDGO risk map, his EGFR puts him in that G2 row, but his severe albuminuria catapults him all the way over to the far right column, he goes from looking like a low-risk patient to being in the highest risk category for progression. This right here, this is that hidden risk that can be so easy to miss. So that dramatic shift forces us to ask a really important question. If his hemodynamics, his blood pressure, his glucose are relatively under control, what are the non-hemodynamic factors that are really driving this level of damage? And this really highlights a key gap in our standard playbook. You know, our go-to therapies, RAS inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors, they're fantastic at targeting the hemodynamic and metabolic pathways, but they don't fully shut down the underlying inflammation and fibrosis that's causing his albuminuria. That damage is largely driven by mineralocorticoid receptor, or MR, overactivation. And that pathway? It just keeps humming along in the background. And this is exactly where finerinone's unique design becomes so clinically relevant. Look at its structure. It's bulky. It's non-steroidal. That gives it incredibly high selectivity for the mineralocorticoid receptor. Compare that to the flat, steroidal structure of older agents like spironolactone, which leads to more off-target effects. So what you get with finer known is potent MR antagonism with a short half-life, no active metabolites, and a minimal risk of those androgenic side effects like gynecomastia. It's just a much cleaner agent to work with. Okay, so that's the pharmacology. But how does this targeted mechanism actually translate to clinical outcomes for patients? Let's take a look at the pivotal trial evidence. Now, the evidence base here is really substantial. We're not talking about a small study. The Fidelity program was a massive, pre-specified pooled analysis of two huge trials, Fidelio DKD and Figaro DKD. All told, that's over 13,000 patients covering the entire spectrum of chronic kidney disease in type 2 diabetes. And the main finding? Really comprehensive cardiorenal production. Finerinone delivered a 14% relative risk reduction for the composite cardiovascular endpoint, and importantly, a 23% reduction for the composite kidney endpoint. And I really want to highlight this one, a 22% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. That is a particularly strong signal and a major driver of morbidity for these patients. This is great, but it brings us to a really critical question for modern practice. How does finerinone fit in with the other pillars of care we're already using, specifically SGLT2 inhibitors? Well, the confidence trial was designed to answer exactly that question. It looked at the simultaneous upfront initiation of finerinone plus an SGLT2 inhibitor, in this case empagliflozin, and compared that to starting either drug alone, all in patients who were already on optimized RAS inhibition. And the results for the primary endpoint were pretty definitive. The combination therapy led to a much superior reduction in albuminuria, a 52% drop at 180 days. That's a significantly greater effect than adding either agent on its own, which really suggests these drugs have complementary mechanisms of action. Now, here's the crucial part. This superior efficacy did not come with a safety trade-off. The safety profile of the combination was comparable to monotherapy, and look at that discontinuation rate for hyperkalemia, less than 
That gives us the reassurance we need to feel confident about adopting this earlier, more comprehensive treatment strategy. Okay, so we've seen the powerful evidence. Let's get practical and translate this into our clinical workflow. How do you actually use this in your day-to-day -day practice? The dosing protocol is actually quite straightforward. You start with two key checks at baseline. First, the EGFR has to be 25 or higher. And second, the serum potassium has to be 5.0 or less. If those are met, the starting dose is based on EGFR. For patients with an EGFR of 60 or more, you can go straight to the 20 milligram target dose. For those with more advanced CKD, between 25 and 59, you'll start at 10 milligrams. The key follow-up is four weeks later. You recheck labs, and if their potassium is stable at 4.8 or less, you uptitrate that 10 milligram group to the full 20 milligram dose. We want to get them to that target dose to ensure they're getting that maximal cardiorenal benefit we saw in the trials. Now let's talk about hyperkalemia, because it's obviously the main thing we think about. The data really suggests we should view it as a manageable parameter, not an absolute barrier. I mean, discontinuation in the big trials was very low, just 1.7%. The management protocol is simple. If potassium goes above 5.5, you withhold treatment. And once it comes back down to 5.0 or less, you can safely restart at the 10 milligram dose. So to make this super easy to remember in a busy clinic, you can just use the five fives framework. You initiate when potassium is less than or equal to five. You withhold if it rises above 5.5. And then remember the outcomes. It reduces the risk of both heart failure hospitalization and end-stage kidney disease by more than one-fifth. Those are really the critical numbers for safe and effective use. So when you put all this together, the evidence from fidelity and confidence, it leaves us with a really provocative and essential question. Have we reached a point where we should be rethinking our entire approach? Should we move away from that traditional, slow, sequential model and instead move toward a rapid, multi-pillar strategy as the new standard of care for cardiorenal protection? The data certainly suggests it's time we have that conversation.